Welcome, welcome, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the first session in our eDNA webinar series. My name is Sam Semino, and I'll be monitoring today's webinar. I work for the USGS, where all my time is dedicated to the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAMP for short. PNAMP, along with StreamNet, co-led the planning of this webinar series, and the planning group included 13 people from a variety of organizations, including one of our presenters today, David Pilliad. David helped organize this eDNA webinar series and selected all those who will be presenting throughout the next couple of weeks. So this is a pretty simple overview of our agenda today. After I wrap up this welcome, we'll do a couple quick icebreaker questions uh, to get everyone loose and familiar with using Microsoft Teams. It's great that you've at least joined us, so we're you know most of the way there, but we're gonna use some of the features of Teams and um, kind of make this a little more interactive. We are planning on about a 45 minute presentation with David and Matt, uh, this could go over, but um, we'll have plenty of time for discussion and question and answer. So a few tips, please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. You probably were automatically muted when you joined. Um, you can unmute yourself just by clicking the little microphone button on the screen, and this may include you moving your mouse over the screen to view that microphone, or it could be stuck at the top of your screen. Um, but clicking that on and off will mute you and unmute you. If you're on the phone listening in, you can hit star six to mute and unmute yourself. So yeah, regardless of the version, uh, the icons should all look the same. Uh, they might be in different orders uh, than what's shown on my screen, but they all function the same way. If you're having trouble with your audio, check the device settings, which you can get to by clicking on the ellipses. And then you can always use the meeting chat to contact the organizers, which is myself and my coworker, Amy Poles and we can help out. And then when we get to it, when we get to our question and answers, there's two ways that we're gonna uh, work on this. If you have a question, you have the option to type your question into the chat, which is that little bubble feature, or you can raise your hand and then we'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask the question through the audio. We will be checking the chat and we can uh, throughout the presentation. So if you have a question early on, you know, we'll probably see it and find it. But if you want to add it again later, if we haven't answered it, feel free to do that too. For fun, let's start off with our first icebreaker question. Um, this is Again, just gonna be for fun. My coworker, Amy, is gonna throw it into our chat and it looks like it's there. So click on the link in the chat and that should open up the icebreaker. And we will do a live poll and see what people are seeing. So it looks like a few of you are getting into it. Question, what's your favorite genetically modified movie monster? And yeah, we get, we're getting some coming in. 29 so far. All right, this is good. Looks like the T-Rex from Jurassic Park is pulling away. It's slowing down, so maybe I'll switch back. But feel free. Oh, a couple people are putting in there. <laughs> Uh, responses into the chat, including vegetables. Very good. Yeah, it uh, looks like T-Rex is going to get the win, though. 
All right. And so now we're going to add in, we have another icebreaker question just to really get our fingers flowing and know how to use the chat function and Mentimeter. And the second icebreaker question, how many eDNA papers have you read in your lifetime? All right, yeah, I'll give you guys a few more seconds on this, but it looks like we have a pretty good distribution here. A um, lot of experience, eDNA folk, a few, none at all. So this will be a good presentation for everyone, but it is uh, tailored for, yeah, just about anyone with any sort of experience or tons of experience, no experience at all. Okay, well, thanks for getting into that. Um, I think I think we all know how to use the the chat and access the Mentimeter. And so I am going to now switch it over to our first presenter, David. If you want to take control to share your screen, I'll stop sharing mine. All right. Cool. And before. Before you get started, let me introduce you real quick. So yeah, our first presenter, David Pilliot, is a supervisory research ecologist at the USGS Forest and Rangeland Ecosystem Science Center and graduate faculty at Boise State University. David's research focuses on the ecology observation and restoration of aquatic, riparian, and terrestrial ecosystems in the Great Basin and Intermountain West. David received his BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and PhD from Idaho State University. He lives in Boise, Idaho with his wife and two dogs. Take it away, David. All right, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. This is um, the beginning of a three-part series on, on eDNA. We decided to to call it uh, eDNA 101 uh, as a kind of gentle int introduction. But um, in this uh, first part of the three-part series, we're going to be focusing on sampling and extraction methods. So this is really designed for uh, all levels of interest in eDNA, but um, might be particularly useful for people with no experience or people that are um, more on the on the kind of field side of things for um, an agency or, or a university and then might be sending off their samples. But the second part of eDNA 101 on extraction methods, we're, we're going to get into some of the lab parts and that's going to be led by Matthew Laramie. Matthew is an ecologist um, at the uh, Pacific Northwest Environmental DNA Lab, part of FRESC, and he's also the lab manager there. And Matt has been working uh, with eDNA uh, for about 10 years or more. And um, so he'll get into the details a bit on extraction methods. eDNA 201, which will be at the same time a week from today, um, is going to get into further into the laboratory methods of um, species detection using uh, various methods. That's going to be led by Carl Osberg. And um, and then eDNA 301 will get into more the the meta barcoding uh, community level biodiversity type assessments using eDNA, and that's led by Taylor Wilcox. And uh, each of these are intended to get more and more uh, detailed. So there is something for everybody, but um, uh, they will get more more detailed and more complicated as we go along. Hey David, do you want to minimize that little? ETIS webinar. Um, yeah, you bet. Perfect. Gone. Yeah, so that actually would have been a little video of me, but um, I'm working from home or teleworking as a lot of folks are, and so I'm not able to, to share my video just to maintain the bandwidth, uh, make sure this goes smoothly. 
OK, so the outline for the eDNA 101 presentation today, I'm going to start out with a brief history of eDNA, um, give an overview of eDNA field methods, and then hand it off to Matt Laramie to cover the eDNA extraction and archiving methods. Uh, throughout each of these sections, we're going to uh, do a little bit of comparison uh, of some uh, studies that have looked at different methods, but it's not enough time to get into the details of, of what works best where. Um, but for that, uh, we will focus on some challenges and considerations and insights just to help people think about what they need to be discussing as you get into eDNA research. Okay, so we'll start out with a definition of environmental DNA, um, which is not so easy, uh, but simplistically uh, defined as DNA isolated from environmental samples, usually water, soil, sediment, biofilms and, and even air. Um, that simple definition was provided by Jan Pawlowski in a recent paper um, in molecular ecology. And uh, Jan contrasted that to genomic DNA that is extracted directly or indirectly from specimens. Um, I've shown some indirect extractions uh, below pictures such as like shed snake skins, for example, or hair, um, eggshells, <coughs> feathers. Um, some might view those as eDNA, but really that's part of the organism itself and um, in some definitions might be considered just uh, an extension or an indirect measure of the specimen. Um, so eDNA is something that's in the environment. Um, an exception might be scat. Um, certainly there are epithelial cells um, shed on the outside of scat um, and that would be more or less an extension of the animal itself, but what the animal ate, if you're doing an analysis of the uh, diet, that could be considered environmental DNA because it's passing through another organism. So that might be a, a bit of a, an exception, but you can see it's not easy to define environmental DNA and that's something that working groups are struggling with right now um, to, to, to make it clear for the field moving forward. The field is moving very rapidly. This is um, a figure of the number of papers published on eDNA um, at the time of this publication, which was in 2020, there was about a thousand papers that have been published. Um, and generally people would like to see eDNA focused on macroorganisms, this microbial uh, community, and you can see that in the green lines. Um, but that's not uh, agreed upon by everybody. In fact, Jan in this paper suggests that we need to be thinking about the microbial eDNA literature as well, which you can see goes back much further in those blue lines. Um, and then the red is, is both, it's covering microbial and microbial um, together in the same papers. But you can see this is a very rapid growth. The other thing that Jan has uh, emphasized in this recent paper in molecular ecology is that um, if we we are to embrace both in the eDNA uh, field we need to be clear about what the target environments are whether it's soil sediment biofilm or water um, they left out air here because it's such an emerging field but uh, and then you know be explicit about the DNA being extracted the method PCR for example um, and then the target taxa that this is uh, focused on so there's a uh, you know room for for both to be included in the eDNA field for the purposes of this presentation i'm going to be focusing on water uh, and this is the pnamp working group and, and a lot of this is uh, focused on aquatic organisms and so that's what i will talk about today and and i think we will focus on for the whole series but um a lot of eDNA is just coming off of living organisms, whether it's secreted from uh, shed uh, skin cells, epithelial cells, or uh, secretions, membranes, um, interfacing with the environment or so forth. eDNA is also produced from reproduction events where gametes are released into the water, particularly for external fertilization, um, where um, it's directly in contact with the the water around it. And it's uh, being released from dead organisms as well, which is a bit of a challenge because you may find eDNA in the water, but you don't know if it came from a living or a dead organism. So this DNA is moving through the environment and um, 
we can think about how it moves, where it um, is most concentrated, where it settles out, how long it stays in the environment. These are all really good questions, and actually the field has developed so quickly that we don't really have a good answer to all of those questions, but the science is working on it rapidly. And ideally, you have to somehow capture that DNA from the environment and um, somehow concentrate it, make it into a sample that you can um, understand something from. And realize when you're collecting DNA from water that you're getting all the DNA that was captured by that sample. Um, so it's not just your target organism, it's, it's um, DNA from microbial organisms, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, um, animals, plants, so forth. So you, you are dealing with a very complex cup of water there, complex sample, and then the trick is to be able to detect the organism or organisms that you're particularly interested in. So brief history of eDNA, um, I'm going to focus on the macroorganism side of things. I think that's what this group would like to hear. Uh, the first paper uh, was published in 2008 by a group of French scientists um, led by Francesco Fisitola. And uh, he was looking at the American bullfrog in France, which is an introduced species and a predator and a disease spreader, and wanted to know uh, where this bullfrog invasive species had, had been distributed in parts of France. Um, and in the in the difficult task of, of searching wetlands for an in, 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 in invading species, which often happens to be at low density, um, he thought, well, maybe there's a way I could do this genetically. And so um, others had been working on, on related questions, but his paper was the first to really target a vertebrate and um, you do it successfully and kind of a proof of concept. And what he did is he thought, well, let's start with the simplest model system. Let's take a tadpole from the bullfrog, put it in three liters of water and leave it there for 24 hours. Let it do what it's doing in the water and then extract uh, samples or aliquots from this beaker of water. And he chose 15 milliliters as a, as a sample volume. And then uh, be able to essentially use a, an extraction technique and a PCR technique to see if he could detect bullfrogs. And sure enough, it worked. And that has been the catalyst for this rapidly developing field that's happened over the last 12 years. Um, so it's one thing to find a bullfrog tadpole's DNA in three liters of a beaker water. The other is to find their DNA in a natural environment where there's um, variations in temperature, there's UV uh, radiation, there's endonucleases and exonucleases, and all sorts of things happening in a natural environment that could be breaking down the DNA so quickly that you would never be able to detect it. So he went out and collected uh, three 15 milliliter samples from the ponds. These were replicates. Uh, and these were ponds where he had done surveys. He knew there was a couple bullfrogs in them, but not very high densities. That's him at the edge of the water there. And um, sure enough, it worked. <laughs> he was able to detect bullfrogs in these pretty large wetlands um, that had low densities of bullfrogs. So that, it's just a, a revolutionary paper. It's very exciting. Um, well, as good scientists do, we needed to repeat Fisitola's beaker study. So um, another group of French scientists uh, led by Tony Dejean, uh, was uh, went out at that task and, and was able to reproduce Fisitola's results. And then took it a step further, started asking questions about persistence of the DNA. How long would it stay in the environment? And he did this uh, with sturgeon in some experiments in some ponds where he introduced sturgeon, a single fish, left it in the pond for 10 days. These were experimental ponds, so they were easy to control the environment, and then removed the sturgeon. And they took 15 milliliter samples daily after that um, to see how long he could still detect the, the DNA of the sturgeon. So the y-axis there is detectability, with one is perfect detection, and zero is no detection. And you can see that on day zero, right when the sturgeon were removed, detection was pretty close to one. And then um, it drops off very quickly, but still, even with a, a pretty small fragment of DNA, about 100 base pairs, 
he was able to detect the sturgeon DNA for about 14 to 21 days in these natural ponds. I mean, kind of pseudo natural ponds in this experiment. So that was also an important discovery because it, it set the time uh, frame that this is not ancient DNA. This is not DNA deposited by an organism um, 10 years ago or five years ago, or even a year ago, potentially. It, it's DNA that's very contemporary and transient, and it may be a good method for detecting species in the natural environment um, that maybe have been there in, in the last few days or weeks. Then came the first real field application at a large scale, and this was um, the Asian carp story in the rivers and canals of the uh, Chicago area. Um, concern about Asian carp, both silver carp and big head carp, getting up into Lake Michigan, and there's all sorts of different types of barriers to prevent that from happening. And um, they went out and collected a thousand two liter wa surface water samples from um, these waterways, canals, rivers, so forth, to, to see how well they could detect the distribution of Asian carp above and below these barriers. Um, and it worked amazingly well. In fact, it worked so well. This is Chris uh, Jurdy's work from Notre Dame and others. And it worked so well that it ended up with lawsuits and, and all sorts of controversy, and, and that somewhat goes on today. Um, so it, it changed the way we view eDNA, but it also drew a lot of scrutiny into what does a positive mean? Is it really a fish or is it the DNA of a fish? And what does that mean? So that's something to think about. Um, then I got involved with this work in, in uh, 2011. All of this is just in the first couple of years. Um, I was uh, talking with Karen Goldberg then at the University of Idaho. She's now at Washington State University about the idea of applying this to fast moving streams where you'd think there's just so much turbulence um, and the streams are so small that DNA would just be flushed out very quickly. Um, and so we we applied this technique for the Idaho giant salamander and the Rocky Mountain tailed frog. And then we compared um, densities of those animals from um, traditional sampling to, to um, the data we were getting back from eDNA samples and found that it worked very well, even in, in fast moving streams. And so um, that was exciting because now we've demonstrated it from ponds to large rivers and canals to fast moving streams. And as you know, today it goes further than that into saltwater systems, um, to, into the open ocean and um, the, the horizon is incredible. Things really got noticed in about 2012 when a group of uh, scientists from Denmark led by Philippe Thompson um, did the first community level study. They were looking at um, diversity of a number of organisms, including some uh, mammals uh, and invertebrates as well and in uh, different waterways. And um, David Lodge put it quite well. He, he called it uh, revolutionary and conservation in a cup of water. Um, the idea that that we could assess whole communities of organisms with water samples using eDNA techniques was was exciting. So that's the brief history. I've just talked about the first couple of years there from 2008 to 2011, as indicated by that circle. Um, you can see that the the number of ma macro organism papers is growing exponentially. Um, and I, I think it will continue for a while as well. There's now an entire journal dedicated to environmental DNA called Environmental DNA. And, um, and there's also a, a several groups of scientists working together to establish uh, best practices and um, protocols and um, all sorts of other aspects to this field that um, we, need, we need to get a handle on early. And so it's exciting. It's a very collaborative community of practice and um, it's been fun to be part of it. So I'm just gonna take a break here from you listening to me and um, go to the Mentimeter. And he here's the question, which eDNA field methods have you used the most? And so I'm gonna hopefully get this to work, jump over here to, to my Mentimeter. You can go in there and we'll, I'm doing it in percentages here so you can see how the numbers I chose these ranges because they are um, pretty common. The 15 milliliter samples are are the ones where you're not filtering it. You're 
you're uh, preserving the whole sample. Uh, and then grab samples are um, ones where you grab it and then send it off to a lab. And then field filtering um, is where you're sitting there at, in the field filtering it. So it looks like things are slowing down a little bit. It looks like we're somewhere between uh, folks having very little experience with field methods and and then folks doing the field filtering themselves. That's great. That helps us to understand where we're where we're at. Excellent. Okay, let's jump back here and go forward. Hopefully this will work. Yes. Okay. So the basic approach to uh, eDNA field methods is to collect a water sample, concentrate that sample, concentrate the DNA in that sample somehow, and then extract the DNA, realizing that you're extracting all of the DNA, and then you're going to try to amplify some target sequence. Um, and then finally, um, try to infer either species presence or, or even abundance. There's, you know, efforts to look at the quantity of DNA and, and what that means for, for um, inferences about species relative abundance. Um, we're going to cover the first three blocks there. So collecting the water sample, concentrating the DNA, and extracting the DNA today. And then eDNA 201 and 301 will touch on that last box. Okay, so this is a, a, a diagram that comes out of a recent paper by Kumar. It's, it's a pretty cool paper. I'd recommend people look at it if you're interested. It's called A Practical Guide to Sample Preservation and Pre-PCR Processing of Aquatic Environmental DNA. It's a nice um, synthesis of information. So um, just to give you, again, a sense of what we're going to cover today, it's everything uh, I'm going to present above that red line there. Um, so the preservation of a water sample. Um, using uh, preservatives or chilling or freezing, and then capturing or concentrating the eDNA in the water sample, like filtration, centrifugation, precipitation. Um, and then if it goes to the lab or it was sent or, or filtered on site, you have to think about other things about preserving the filters, like adding some kind of a buffer or desiccant, like silica beads um, or freezing. What are the implications of those? And then Matt's going to talk about this next section, eDNA extraction. So and all of that together is, is what we're covering in eDNA 101. It's quite a lot. And then eDNA 201 and 301 will be this part on qPCR and sequencing, uh, including digital drop and medic barcoding and these other things you've probably heard about. So let's start with water collection field methods. This is a a, a plethora, a plurality of methods. Um, Look at each of these pictures. Each one is different. Each one is collecting a field sample for eDNA. Different volumes, different tools. Um, some of them, like BioMeme, are, are actually you collect the sample and try to, uh, you know, analyze it right in place using thermocycling with a transportable one. Or uh, this last box in the corner, which is like a automated system for collecting samples. That top, this type, top right one is an interesting one, which we're seeing a little bit more of. And this is robotics um, that can uh, be used where you basically are steering a, a machine out into a, into the environment, so you're not disturbing the the substrate, and then collect the water sample from wherever you want using. Um, uh, some type of robotic uh, machine to get out there. But the basics is you, uh, step one, collect the water sample. And water samples um, have to be collected in sterile containers. That's very important. Um, people ask questions about autoclaving versus uh, bleaching, things like that. Uh, realize that any kind of bleach you use, you know, if, if, it, if, if it stays in the container, it could, it could degrade the DNA that you're trying to catch. So there's all sorts of issues to think about. Autoclaving, also has some issues where it does not just necessarily destroy all the DNA, and so you could have contamination. So single-use containers is uh, very common. We we use uh, whirl packs um, instead of Nalgene's because they're they're disposable and single use and easy to work with, and they come in a variety of sizes. Um, samples vary. It really depends on your question. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but anywhere from 15 milliliters up to a variable amount where now there's instruments that can pump 
uh, and you can let it pump until a filter clogs or you can let it pump at a certain amount um, turning on and off uh, automatically throughout the day for example and so we're really moving into new directions in terms of how much water to collect but I think most people would agree if you're trying to detect something the more water you can collect the better Another big issue of collecting water is w field replicates. You know, what, what is a replicate? Um, so we can think of each of these Nalgene bottles, for example, as a, a replicate, a water sample. But some people, for example, if they're war working in a large wetland, they may collect um, 10 liters of water from different places around the wetland, composite it together, and take aliquots from that pooled sample. And then you have replicates of the pooled sample. So you, you think about what are the implications of that. These are, these are important topics. If you're going to transport water um, to a lab, there's a couple things to think about. One, avoiding sunlight. Uh, this container that he's using is probably not great because it's clear. Uh, we always recommend uh, putting things into a, a, a cooler. It's dark and, and keeps things cool. Chilling is important, or you can freeze on site using liquid nitrogen or something. Um, or if you have a, a vehicle nearby, you can have a cooler with ice or a cooler with uh, uh, an electric one. Um, you can add some type of chemical buffer. That's usually with smaller volumes, like 15 milliliters, something like ethanol, which you can put in, say, a two to one ratio, or isopropanol, um, benza alkonium chloride, uh, or Longmire's buffer. Those are all ones that you see commonly used in literature. Um, we don't really make recommendations. You, there's papers that are beginning to compare these things, um, but it's complicated as, as you can imagine, and, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. The second step is concentrating the DNA. Um, there's the three main methods is filtration, precipitation, and centrifugation. In this group, you can see that filtration was the most common, um, and in fact, field filtration was the most common. So we'll talk mostly about filtration because that does seem to be very common. The problem with um, the precipitation and centrifugation methods is you're collecting very small amounts of water, usually like 15 milliliters. And that's just such a small volume of water. The amount of DNA in it also is small. Um, whereas filtering, you can collect a lot more of water and then concentrate it onto the filter paper. Filter types are typically in the 47 millimeter diameter, but that's not a a, a rule. There's all sorts of papers that have used different size diameters from very, very small capsules to much larger. Uh, filter pore sizes also range uh, from 0 0.2 to 180 micron. And that's very important because you think about the each DNA fragment that you're trying to target and the number of base pairs varies based on your your assay and the and the um, the, the uh, sequence of DNA that you're trying to target. But the uh, but the pore size also relative to that, right? A larger fragment will be caught better on a different size pore. So um, pore size is important. Sometimes you don't have a lot of choice because whatever product you're buying only comes in 1.2 or 5 micron and you, you just can't get it in any other size. Um, that might change over time as, as manufacturers start working with scientists to to fine-tune specific pore sizes to optimize these methods. Uh, filter materials were reviewed recently by uh, Kumar, and I, I just grabbed this table because I liked it. So this shows the filter matrix, whether it's cellulose, plastic polymer, or glass filament, and then the filter type. And you can see that there's a, a variety of filter types. Um, all of those come in 47 millimeter. They come in different pore sizes, but usually they have restrictions on the range of pore sizes. So I'll just show one paper. This is by Renshaw in 2015. The y-axis here is DNA copy number. It's copies per four microliters. And this is bluegill, uh, a type of fish uh, that used a 100 base pair uh, fragment length that um, was mitochondrial cytochrome B gene. And what you can see on this figure, which is interesting, is that two of the filter types, CN, which is cellulose nitrate, and PES, which is polyether sulfone, um, generated more, uh, yielded more DNA of the bluegill um, than, than the other two, the polycarbonate and the glass fiber filter. Um, 
Interesting, 1.5 micron glass fiber filter is very commonly used in literature. So it's not saying that, 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 that that's wrong and that's the worst method. In fact, you could find other comparative studies that show different results. But um, things to look at, look at the size of the pore size, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.5. So are really, are these fair comparisons? When you have different pore sizes, those are things to consider. Here's another uh, comparison study. This is for perch and pike. Perch is in blue, pike is in white. This is a paper by Spens in 2017. And um, comparing, again, cellulose nitrate, glass fiber, the polycarbonate. EP is ethanol precipitation. So that's the precipitation method that I'm not going to touch on much, but you can see when you don't filter at all and you're just precipitating out the, um, the DNA, these are the yields you can get. And so a couple things to notice that there's a little bit of difference sometimes between the perch and the pike. Um, both have very similar fragment lengths, 89 and 84, same uh, cytochrome B gene. Uh, but there are some differences here. And um, these are the kinds of uh, information that you, you probably want to start considering when you're, when you're talking to folks about what filter material to use and what filter pore size to use. Um, and again, look at this study. The pore size is varied from 0.2 all the way up to 0.6. So yeah, you have a mix here of filter type and pore size that complicates things. So if you are uh, filtering on site, there's a couple things to, to think about. Um, you know, and, and filtering on site can be any, anything from kneeling on the shoreline of this river with a hand pump pumping your your uh, your samples or carrying them back to the truck. Here's those Nalgene uh, grab bottles and, and then pour them, pouring them into some kind of apparatus. This would also be considered uh, filtering on site, even though, um, you know, you, you have the benefit of a truck and so forth. Um, key to stabilize the sample, avoid sunlight, uh, chill or freeze the filter um, so that, you know, the, the filter becomes your sample. And so you want to make sure that it's um, preserved. Um, you can add desiccants or some kind of chemical buffer. Commonly used ones are, are silica gel beads, ethanol, acetyl uh, trimethyl ammonium bromide, CTAB, and Longmire's buffer. Um, and I just show one comparison here. This is also Renshaw's work in 2015 looking at yield, this copy number on the, the y-axis. And this is comparing two types of buffers, the CTAB and Longmire's. And in this study, they found that uh, filters held in Longmire's buffer did much better, yielded more DNA than uh, filters that were stored in CTAB. Uh, there's been other studies that have compared um, these results to freezing, where you you uh, basically you don't put the filter in a in any kind of desiccant or buffer. You just throw it in the freezer, um, and they find that that you get better yield using buffers, whether ethanol, Longmire's, compared to not using any type of a desiccant or buffer. So it seems like it's worth doing something out there, but there's no um, you know, recommendation term, which is the best, something to discuss. Um, the other interesting thing about filtering on site is some of this is becoming automated. And I'm just going to highlight the environmental sample processor. This was developed by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Umbari. Um, and the USGS is, is collaborating with Umbari to instrument some of our stream gauges. This is a, a stream gauge out on a river um, to uh, take samples at regular intervals. And then the samples are, are stored and preserved in these pucks and then a um, a tech um, would go out and, and collect the pucks and bring them back to a lab to be processed. And Adam Sepulveda uh, with USGS and, and colleagues recently published a paper um, comparing this robotic sampling approach to um, just doing field grabs at, at the same time in site. It's, and um, it looked like it worked really well. And this is uh, now we're considering ways to integrate this into the USGS stream gauge system to 
um, use it as a possible way of, for early detection of invasive species. So this is just the frontier. I think things are going to go uh, quickly in this area of automation. There's universities working on this problem. There's private companies working on this problem. Um, there's all sorts of automated samplers that are being developed, some of which are trying to also integrate uh, thermocycling into the automation so you actually can get real-time results uh, from an automated sampler like this. That's, as you can imagine, a lot more complicated. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but that's that's the future. Uh, the other type of concentrating DNA is back at the lab. So if a, if a sample is collected and then um, not filtered on site, it's actually sent back to a laboratory for either centrifugation and precipitation or for um, filtration. Um, those those samples, when they arrive at the laboratory, they, they need to be stored carefully as well. Uh, they need to be kept chilled. They may, may want to be frozen. Um, and because there's degradation happening and you, you want to make sure that that sample is stable. Um, we have done research showing that there's uh, pretty good degradation happening when things are in the freezer on filter paper. Um, even when stored in, in ethanol. So it's important to get the DNA extracted quickly. Um, if all you're interested in is detection, then you have quite a long time. The degradation doesn't happen that fast that you lose detection rates too quickly. But if you want to quantify the amount of DNA on that filter paper, then you would want to get the DNA extracted very quickly. And this is a picture from of Chris Jurdy and his uh, folks at University of Notre Dame. Okay, handling filters is another topic that's a that's an important one to think about and get practiced at. If you're new to this field, um, there's all sorts of room for contamination here. Um, the problem is the filters are large; they're 47 millimeters in diameter, um, so they have to be folded or rolled somehow to get into these little cryotubes. These cryotubes are usually 1.5 milliliter, so you have to get them in there and jam them in there. Um, or you can use a larger falcon tube or something like that that can be up to 50 milliliters. But um, that this is an area where contamination uh, has potential and, and it's important to follow the protocols that are developed and train people very carefully because if, um, if not done well, this would be a major source of contamination. In our research, we found the protocols do work well, and uh, if done carefully, you, you don't have any contamination. Um, things to, to be aware of is you know, single-use tweezers, for example, wearing gloves, and, and thinking about the downstream um, side of things. So the water passes through from upstream to downstream. The downstream side of this um, you know, may be closer to, um, to, the, to the water, and, and you wouldn't want contamination there. So a couple things to think about. Okay, I'm winding down. I'm just going to finish up uh, my presentation with some thought-provoking ideas of challenges and considerations. Um, and I like this figure by Matt Barnes. Um, this is the idea that you know eDNA concentration in the environment this is is really a function of production minus degradation. Um, and there's other factors, of course, but but that's simplistically the way we can break it down. Where production is is things like animal density, animal health reproductive status and metabolism of the animal can really influence how much DNA is in the environment. Um, and then there's degradation processes counteracting these in real time when you're out there. Um, and so things like the characteristics of the DNA, which could be influenced by the fragment length that you're trying to target, um, whether it's membrane bound or not, it's confirmation. Uh, characteristics of the environment that maybe some of these you'd want to measure because you could include these in models, uh, things like light and oxygen, pH, salinity, and substrate. Um, and then characteristics of the biotic environment, microbial community, and extracellular enzymes. All of these have been studied and found to be important in various ways. But you, know, you think about the animal releasing the DNA, and it, it, through time, is breaking smaller and smaller and smaller to a point where you can no longer detect it. So it's thinking about that process and, and what's the question you're trying to answer. Um, so a couple of sampling and design questions to discuss with your colleagues or, or with the lab that you're working with. Um, how much water should you collect? What method is optimal, including some of the details of those methods like filter type, filter material, pore size. Those aren't trivial. Um, where in the water body water should be collected? What is the uh, spatial inference of a sample? 
you know, or how, how far away if you take a sample in, a, in one location, what does that represent? The whole water body or just 10 feet away? How many field replicates do you need? What time of day should samples be collected? What month or season should samples be collected? I mean, that all could relate to the biology of the animal, but also the environment. How do eDNA field methods compare or combine with traditional methods? You know, a lot of this stuff is, is not necessarily replacing, but complementing traditional methods. And uh, Barnes and Turner in 2015 published a paper that I, I really liked this figure. So I just thought I'd share it with you, the, the ecology of eDNA, which is, Complicated, as I've been implying here, but um, we could think about a the the origin, um, you know, either primary from released by the animal or secondary because of some other activity of another animal, like a predator or a scavenger or something. Um, the state of the DNA is it is it within membrane bound uh, cells or tissues even. Um, or is it outside? You know, is it dissolved? Um, and then you know, is it how is it moving in the environment? Is it settling out? Is there uh, adsorption to particulates? And then it's actually getting into the sediment or substrate. Um, and then what's the fate of that in terms of uh, degradation mechanisms, enzymatic or mechanical, chemical radiation, um, and then horizontal gene transfer? And all of this, you can think of these technical challenges in terms of design, collection, um, capture, extraction, assay, all of these elements, and, and you could read the paper, but I think this is these are really good things to be thinking about when designing a, an effective study. And just to give a couple examples, so um, you could think of reproduction. If, if there's a reproductive event with a fish, for example, you might get this very steep pulse in eDNA, but it's very short-lived and then tapers off. Um, that might be your question, but if it's not, you might get some weird results if you happen to be sampling through the reproductive period. And if there's a lot of decomposition going on, you might also get that spike. So that would be an example of origin influencing the temporal uh, nature of your sampling. And then the state of the DNA, um, obviously influenced by pore size and filter type, but also by um, other characteristics such as um, um, sediments, suspended sediments in the water could influence how much DNA you're able to concentrate, capture. Um, transport, um, we are, are getting good information now about this process. There's some decent models that are being developed, but the idea that DNA is settling out into the substrate, into sediments, and that can be resuspended when there's turbulent water, or if if one of the field crew walks in the water to take a sample, you could resuspend samples, um, and the animal might not have been there for a long time, even there's evidence up to a year potentially, um, and you're still getting a positive simply because you've resuspended old DNA. Um, so we're really trying to get a handle on understanding that, but something to be aware of. And then finally, fate. There's different decay rates for this stuff um, based on fragment length, um, partly larger fragments break down faster than smaller fragments. So that can influence um, you know, your detection rates depending on your fragment length size. So take home message, think about these questions and be asking them with your colleagues and with your um, labs that you're working with to make sure that you have a robust design. I'm just going to finish up by pointing out a, a really cool paper um, by Turner that that looked at um, this pore size question because I think it's so important and um, I just think it, it's a neat visual to, to take away. So here's your water body. They took a 12 liter uh, sample from that and then they ran it through um, different pore sizes okay starting at 200 uh, they put 250 milliliters through excuse me um, trying to isolate suspended particulate matter and then DNA and um, you can see the the pore size 180 micron all the way down to 0.2 and then whatever went through the last filter the 0.2 micron filter they collected that too and ran it through centrifugation so um, they were able to get whatever didn't get caught by any of the filter pore sizes. Um, and they, they used a qubit to get total eDNA and PCR to get this CARP DNA. So let me just show you the, the results from that cool study. So these are those pore sizes, 180 down to whatever went through all of them. They didn't get any of the suspended particulate matter through through the point two. So that cut everything out and you can see the distribution collected on these various uh, 
filter pore sizes. So that's suspended particulate matter. Okay, here's total eDNA collected. You can see it's somewhat opposite. Most of the eDNA, this is uh, all eDNA going through, pass through these larger pore sizes, so pretty ineffective at catching DNA. And then once you get down to about 20 micron, um, you start picking up good amounts and a lot of the DNA pass through all of those filters and ended up in the, the kind of discharge water. And, um, and you can see that in the bar here. If you compare the total eDNA represented, um, it only represented less than 0.1% of the suspended particulate matter. So, you know, we're talking very, very small quantities of DNA, even when we're at total DNA. Now let's look at CARP DNA. This was 146 base pair um, fragment length that they were using their assay for. And the thing to take away from this is they got CARP DNA in all of them, even the 180, somehow they caught, must have been a, a, a large cell or something that, um, but they did get some DNA in all pore sizes uh, for CARP DNA. And, um, but the majority was in this one micron range. So this study allowed them to focus on what might be the optimal pore size for CARP DNA using this fragment length. Um, but interestingly enough, they found that CARP DNA represented less than 0.0004% of total eDNA in the sample. So less than 0.004% of this. So there's all sorts of other organismal DNA that's out there that you know, they're not even looking at. Um, so it just gives you some perspective when you're when you're targeting a specific organism, what you're really pulling out of that uh, eDNA sample. Okay, that's my section of the talk. I'm going to hand this off to Matt, but I just wanted to highlight there are field protocols out there that I recommend you dive into. Um, the, some produced by the federal government, like the USGS here. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Forest Service here, and then academic universities and private institutions, and so so. Um, these are some resources, and if folks are interested, I can I can send out this list of protocols. Um, just well, I think we might have lost David there. Mention it, lose me. Oh, yeah, we got you back. Oh, phew. Okay. Um, I'm just going to finish up um, and transition to Matt here with another Mentimeter. So this is um, another question. What filter pore size have you used for filtration of eDNA samples? This one you can select all that applies. You can do multi-select. And uh, I'm going to jump over here and go to the second Mentimeter here. So we're transitioning over to Matt here for the second part of this eDNA 101. And while those results are coming in, I will introduce Matt real quick. Um, Matthew Laramie is an ecologist with the USGS. Over the last 10 years, his research has focused on stream ecology, interactions of wild and hatchery salmonids, and environmental DNA as a tool for assessing species distributions. If he's not in the lab, you'll probably find him out on the river. Well, it looks like we have everyone who's probably going to do the survey has done it. Um, so now, Matt, if you want to start sharing your screen. Sure. You guys able to hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Okay. You got my slides up there, full screen? Yes. Uh, could you minimize, though, in the bottom right-hand corner, the that little, uh, yes, perfect. All right. Got You're it. good to go. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so just to kind of reiterate, uh, David has covered up through DNA capture and field preservation, and we're now at this at the point of DNA extraction. You know, this is a laboratory procedure; it precedes analysis. We're going to go over um, extraction methods now, and then we'll follow up with the analysis portion in the next two uh, webinars in this series. But you know, before we get into the extraction methods, 
I want to revisit what it is that makes up our eDNA sample. You know, it, it generally consists of DNA from those species present at the site, as, as David has explained, but it also has this whole suite of other materials. There's things like sediment and suspended particles and any of these other organic or inorganic compounds, things like tannins and humic acid, uh, which is just basically fully decomposed organics, um, among other things. Who knows? Uh, and so just for the sake of today's kind of example, I'm going to kind of continue uh, with David's approach and just walk through this from an aquatic freshwater perspective. But really, you know, whether we're talking about freshwater, marine, or terrestrial samples, uh, the goal of extraction is going to be the same. We, we need to isolate DNA from the bulk sample and stabilize it for the short term uh, for analysis. And it doesn't really matter whether that's qPCR, droplet digital PCR, or metabarcoding. The process is basically going to be the same. Um, and then, of course, in the end, these samples are likely to be archived for future analysis. Uh, I'm also going to point out a concept here in the beginning that we're going to return to later on, and that is uh, uh, a line from Hindle et al. 2017, where they said that various combinations of DNA capture, preservation, and extraction methods can significantly affect DNA yield. And this is going to be an important idea to keep in mind during this talk. I'm also going to throw out uh, one kind of disclaimer here before we dig in too much, and that is that, you know, sample contamination is a very real concern, not just in the field, but also in the laboratory. Uh, contamination, you know, at minimum can lead to some headaches and a lot of time and expense in order to sort it out. And if it were to go undiagnosed, it could actually just lead to conclusions that are just plain wrong regarding your samples. So uh, because of this real potential for contamination, it's, it's my opinion that, that extractions really ought to be performed in eDNA-specific facilities. And essentially, this is something that would kind of approach clean room ISO standards. Uh, currently, we don't have any regulatory standards in place for eDNA laboratories. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if someday this, this field does get to a point where we have that, at least for some lab. Uh, so far, it's, it's really just kind of been up to the field itself and to the researchers to sort of self-regulate. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why I'm bringing it up here in the beginning, you know, because it is crucial, you know, to be able to, you know, consistently produce defensible data. And so what that looks like at minimum, you know, it means that DNA extractions, the procedures themselves, ought to be isolated from most of the potential sources of contamination, especially PCR product. That's going to be the big one. But also, you know, live and dead organisms. Now, there should also be routine sterilization strategies in place that use bleach or other products like uh, DNA away to sterilize the equipment as well as the work surfaces. You can use UV radiation. That can also be useful for this. UV does attenuate pretty quickly in space, though, so it needs to be uh, powerful and or pretty close to the surfaces that you're trying to sterilize to be effective. And we should also even consider things like airflow within a building. We want to minimize the potential transport of aerosols from, you know, what we might consider a contaminated room into an uncontaminated room performing our DNA extractions. So if if your study is like involving fish, I'm not going to recommend that this work be carried out in, in some lab space you might have available in like a fish pathology lab where you're going to routinely handle these target organisms or in a facility that houses both a hatchery and a lab. You know, those are both going to be far from ideal for this purpose. And, you know, so right away you might be thinking that this stage of the workflow you know, it might not be appropriate for you. And if that's the case, that might be correct. The, this potential for contamination is pretty high, certainly if you were to ignore most of these considerations. But in the right facility, we found that these risks can be significantly minimized and managed. Uh, so that in most cases, they can even become mostly just a non-issue. So moving on from, from that note, uh, let's, let's move into some of the methods that are in use today. There's uh, First, I should say, this is not really, based on the time we have allowed, this is not comprehensive, but these methods I'm showing you here do seem to be some of the most common methods that, that we're seeing in the literature today. Basically, we have several commercially available kits, things like the DNEasy kit from Kyogen. Uh, there's a power water kit. 
that was formerly from Mobio, I believe. I understand now that's being offered by Tiagen, though. Uh, these are just two examples. There's a whole bunch of other choices. And these kits tend to work really well for samples that were initially preserved by ethanol or by desiccation, such as in silica beads, um, also by freezing. Uh, there's also some chemical formulations that can be used as precipitation methods, and that includes things like CTAB and phenochloroform. These methods work really well for samples that are initially preserved by a buffer solution and, in fact, have some advantages when they're uh, used with uh, Longmire's buffer solution. Uh, they also have some advantages of being quite a bit cheaper than commercial kits. And one of the downsides, I might add, though, is that uh, they also involve some acutely toxic chemicals. So, you know, personally, I'm actually less familiar with, with these methods than I am with the kits. So uh, I'll just refer you to the paper that I've, I've mentioned down here by Renshaw et al. And um, that paper does an excellent job of explaining the workflow for these methods. And instead, uh, we'll walk through an example of an extraction protocol. And this is one that we use a lot in our lab. And it uses the DNEZ kit. I believe this. Um, I think this, this whole protocol originated from the Goldberg et al. paper, the 2011 paper that David mentioned earlier, um, especially the incorporation of the, the Kaya Shredder step. And, and that's a modification to the manufacturer's protocol, and it allows us to use this, this DNEZ kit with filter papers. Essentially, it's, a, it's about a two-day protocol. Uh, there's a lot of repetitive pipetting and centrifuging, or lab techs can attest to that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really showing you this to like teach you how to do it, but rather just to kind of give you an idea of what types of steps are involved in an extraction. And so for this kit, basically day one is where we're lysing cells within the sample. We do this with a lysis buffer. That allows DNA to go into suspension and it requires some incubation at higher temperatures along with some vortexing to physically mix the sample. And the following day, we remove the filter materials and we do that using this additional Kaya Shredder step. And then the sample goes through a series of washes that hopefully removes uh, the majority of the undesirable compounds. <clears throat> and finally, you know, DNA gets eluted into a cryo storage file. And we do that using a stabilizing buffer, generally at a volume somewhere around 100 or 200 microliters. And at this point, your sample's ready for analysis or, or archiving. And as I mentioned, this is just one example of uh, several of the methods that are in use. But uh, with that in mind, we can kind of take a look at some of the comparisons that have been done. Uh, this plot here shows DNA yield on the Y and three extraction methods on the X. The DNEZ kit that we just walked through is, is the first one there, followed by the power water kit and then the phenochloroform method. And the colors on this are representative of the uh, five different filter types that were used to collect samples. These are the same, some of the same filters that David brought up in his talk. Um, if we look first just at the DNEZ treatment, you know, you can see just within that one treatment, there's a lot of variability in yield among those filter types. There's excellent yield using the cellulose nitrate filter, a pretty poor yield using um, especially the one in the green, one of the poly filters. Across treatments, uh, most of these combinations produce viable yields, uh, with the only exception is the glass fiber filter and power water combination. Uh, it's the one that's right down there at zero. Um, you know, based on this one study, I wouldn't recommend that particular combination. Um, but I, I, you know, the glass fiber filters are in use uh, all over the place in eDNA, and with other combinations, they perform very well. So um, these aren't the only aspects to consider when you're choosing your method. This is uh, this this slide shows another comparative study. Uh, it was done looking at the same extraction methods. So on the X here, we have phenochloroform, power water kit, and the DNEZ kit. And this time we have, uh, let's see, we have detection rate on the Y and for four different freshwater macroinvertebrates. And instead of filter types, we're now looking at DNA capture method, whether it was filtered or precipitated in the field. And that's represented here in the red and the blue. And so with this one, what we see right off is that the results 
aren't consistent across taxa. This is pretty profound. The combinations that produce reasonable detection for one species are failing entirely in some cases for other species. And this could be due to variable concentrations of DNA for these organisms, or it might be due to differences in fragment length of the different assays, the amplicons that they were targeting. Uh, studies have also shown that these same types of differences exist across, you know, not just different species, but also across different habitat types as well. You can imagine a, a combination that performs really well in crystal clear headwaters of a trout stream that might perform differently in a giant turbid river like the Mississippi or in, in brackish wetlands. Uh, and these are just some of the reasons I'm pointing out of, you know, why it's so difficult to recommend to someone a single standardized protocol for all the eDNA work. And this is an idea we're going to come back around to here as well. At this point, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about um, another aspect of this workflow, and that is PCR inhibition or sample inhibition, um, because this is something you could deal with at this extraction stage. Uh, inhibition is caused by those co-extracted elements that I mentioned before, the sediments, suspended particles, and other substances that, you know, that polyphenolic compounds, tannins, humic acid, any of these things. And, you know, not, not all of our work, uh, you know, can take place in these crystal clear headwaters. So if we're sampling turbid waters, waters with a lot of debris, these compounds are definitely going to end up in the samples. If they remain there, they can, they can lead to reduced reaction efficiency as well as delayed or even no amplification during analysis. This tends to happen um, through several mechanisms. It can be, you know, these inhibitors can reduce DNA polymerase activity. They can change buffer compositions. They can bind to nucleic acids in cells. Uh, they can even quench the fluorescent signal of the DNA binding dyes uh, that we use in qPCR assays. I realize we haven't really covered some of these these concepts yet, but this is all kind of things to keep in mind during the during the uh, the 201 webinar that's going to go over qPCR. But uh, I do want to talk about, you know, why why does this matter? And uh, I, this is a really neat figure from uh, the trough at all a recent paper in 2020, and it, it, it's a schematic that shows the codependency of of detection probability on target DNA concentration and the concentration of inhibitors. So the colors are indicating the detection probability, with low being yellow and high being green. Um, and what we see on this plot is that detection probability increases with eDNA concentration, and that's that's going from left to right along the X, and then it decreases with inhibitor concentrations, and that's along the Y, especially along the right side of the Y. And in that, what that means is that you know, at low uh, detection probability is going to be low when both of these variables are high, such as in the top right uh, portion of this plot. In other words, like when you have Plenty of target organism DNA, samples containing lots of inhibitors can still lead to a non-detection or low detection probability. Uh, any water body or even a site within a water body, because inhibitors can vary across several different sites within a single stream or a pond, for example. So at any site, we can characterize um, that site by its ratio of inhibitors and target DNA concentrations. There's three examples shown on this schematic and those are represented by the black dotted lines and numbered one, two, three. Those are basically, imagine those are three sites. So that <clears throat> if we were to change our sampling methods, for example, like we go and we collect more water at a site, that would result in more target DNA and more, and more inhibitors in the sample. And those shifts are represented, uh, as you kind of look from left to right, you can see from the across to a dot within one of those trajectories. That's a change in sampling method. Um, if we use these examples, an increase in sampled water volume, in some cases, like line one, is going to increase your detection probability. That's at a site that has low inhibitor concentration. In other sites, it's going to decrease your detection probability, and that's in line two. Because at some point, you now have more inhibitors present in the sample, and you're now approaching levels that are going to be affecting the reactions. You sort of cross the threshold, if you will. Uh, line three shows an example of a site where maybe the detection probability doesn't change, even though you're collecting more water 
so how do we deal with this? Uh, there's, there's a couple of post-extraction mitigation methods that we can use. Um, one such method is dilution. It's, you know, it's both cheap and effective. You simply dilute a sample prior to running it. Uh, that effectively cuts the number or the concentration of inhibitors in half. Uh, most often, there's still going to be enough DNA present in the sample to still produce a positive signal. The, the exception to that is if you're down at the absolute minimum threshold for detection. Um, there's also some commercially available kits that have been shown to be really effective. They do increase processing costs a bit, though, so that's something to consider. If you know you're going to be working in a system that's really turbid or has a lot of inhibition potential to budget for, um, it's approximately with the kit that I mentioned here, this is IMO kit, you're looking at about two bucks a sample. There's also some additional costs for lab tech time for handling and performing these, these additional procedures. Uh, but as far as, you know, how, we, how do we identify inhibition in the first place in the sample? Uh, this is done through the inclusion of process controls. So in this case, we're using uh, positive controls in this case. Uh, these can be, uh, you can use commercially available internal positive controls for this, or you can even develop your own and, and spike your own synthesized DNA fragments into samples. Uh, either way, this is going to allow you to assess whether a PCR reaction is impaired, and if it is, you know, to what extent is that inhibition uh, taking place. And, you know, with that, you can then kind of decide if one of these mit mitigation methods is going to be necessary. And finally, for archiving, freezing is the recommended storage method. Minus 20 is going to be fine for short term, just between uh, extraction and analysis with minus 80 being the recommended um, temperature for any long-term archiving. You should also strive to minimize freeze-thaw cycles as much as possible, uh, as well as minimize long-term exposure to light. And then kind of to wrap up here, I wanted to share a line from the comparison paper that we looked at earlier with the four invertebrate species. And this says, a general agreement on the use of exact protocols is not necessarily needed nor possible given the rapid change in genetic technology. And more recently, another methods comparison paper states that they're contrasting results of methods comparisons across habitats and species highlight that there might not be a universal optimal sampling method, but instead adjustments will likely need to be made to account for local conditions as required. Um, you know, as, as frustrating as this might be for someone who's just trying to employ eDNA surveys, um, you know, the fact that I don't have just a single recommended protocol that works across all eDNA applications, um, you know, I understand that could be frustrating, but I, I really, I look at this more as a plus. Um, you know, as, as they also mentioned in that trial paper, I think, you know, a variety of methods better serves a variety of applications. Uh, but that said, we still do have the responsibility to identify and report limitations of the methods that we're employing. What that means is that for your chosen combination of uh, methods, methods for DNA capture, for preservation, extraction, and analysis, the limitations ought to be determined empirically. And that includes limits of detection, limits of quantitation, as well as the detection probability. You know, that way we have a uh, an understanding, a way to quantify the actual performance of the overall sampling and analysis strategy. I believe these are some of the topics that are going to be covered in detail by Carl Osberg in our next session uh, on eDNA 201, the analysis portion. And that's, uh, that's that wraps it up for extraction here. Great, thanks, Matt. And uh, just a reminder, if you guys want to type in your questions into the meeting chat, or you can raise your hand using the little hand icon at either the top of your screen, or if you roll over the screen, you'll see it. Uh, we'll call on you and you can then unmute yourself and ask some questions. Um, but I do have one question in the chat already, and it is, can eDNA be used to distinguish homozygote, homozygotes and heterozygotes of Chinook salmon using samples from spawning reds? 
And David, if you're talking or Matt, if you're talking, make sure you unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, I'm back. Um, the uh, it, it depends, I guess. If you're doing um, generally, most of the assays that are available today are, are looking at mitochondrial DNA. So we're looking at that maternally inherited portion of, of the DNA from these samples. There's you can a lot of a lot of the uh, evidence is also showing that entire cells are being collected in these processes, though. So I think there's a lot of potential to look at uh, beyond mitochondrial DNA. And so I don't I have not seen that yet, but I think there's some potential for this. Great, thanks. We have another question in the chat. Do you rec do you recommend a way to concentrate DNA that has been extracted via column kit? Column kit. Yes. Uh, no, I don't have a recommendation on that. I'm not familiar with that one. To be honest with you. I, the methods that we the methods that we showed though, whether it's using a kit or or one of the chemical precipitation methods are likely to be, you know, there, you could modify those as necessary to probably work with it. I don't know if that's one that uses a, that pelletizes the DNA first, but these can be adapted pretty well for most methods. All right, we got another one. Um, can you thoroughly explain what an assay is, please? This is from a, a beginner in the eDNA world. Uh, sure. An assay is a test. So um, in the eDNA context, we generally think of it as molecular assay. It's a, a set of primers and a, a probe if you're using qPCR. Uh, but it's a test where you're testing the sample to determine the presence of a certain fragment of DNA. And one thing about eDNA assays, and I think Carl's going to probably get into this a lot more in the analysis section, but it's not just the set of primers that, that, that you're using to target a fragment. It's really the, um, the qPCR master mix and the, the thermocycler settings, the conditions that the reaction is taking place in. These are all really part of the test. Adjustments to buffer concentrations or temperatures, annealing temperatures, things like that, can really have a pretty drastic effect on specificity of that assay. So it's it's it really it's the whole process, the whole test that you've designed. Um, that's really what we tend to consider as an assay. Great, thanks. We have a question from India. What is the minimum concentration of eDNA extracted by the PCI method that can be used for metabarcoding study? Uh, I don't know the answer to that one either. Maybe somebody's on here that has done more metabarcoding. Tell us the, the minimum concentrations that they use for that. A note on metabarcoding, R third presentation, the eDNA 301 will cover some metabarcoding. Yep. So, so maybe tune into that one. All right, we have another question. To what degree can eDNA be used to assess relative abundance of a given taxon as opposed to just presence absence? Um. Yeah, David, you could chime in on this too if you'd like. But the uh, there's kind of two questions in that question. One is relative abundance of the DNA in the sample, and as far as doing that from one sample to the next, we can do a pretty good job of determining how much of that organism's DNA is in this sample versus that sample. You know, if there's twice as much, that's a pretty easy thing to do. What that means in terms of how many of that organism were present at the site, that's a much more difficult thing to do. And there's been a bunch of papers that have looked at this, and the relationships have have been, some of them pretty good, some of them non-existent when it comes to certain taxa. And, you know, does the abundance of, of that animal's DNA in a sample, how well does that 
you know, what, what inference can you, can you draw based on that regarding how many of them there are at a site? That's a really complex question. There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, but there are some papers that have shown a little bit of promise in that department. Anything you want to add to that one, David? No, that was well said. There is a follow-up. Oh, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just going to say it is it is one of the emerging areas of research that people are working hard on. So we'll see. Things might develop more in the next few years. Great. There is a follow-up to that question. And uh, do you think eDNA could ever be used to assess if a salmon red was trampled or not based on the relative quantity of cow DNA at a trampled red compared to an untrampled red? <laughs> <laughs> Very specific. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, that's, I don't know. That's such a long shot, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to say no because this field is just so the advancements are incredible that have been made but that's an awful specific question i'm not sure if it could do that or not <laughs> okay yeah, we have we another did, oh go ahead Dave. i was just saying we did did some research um looking at the the dna around in the water around salmon reds and um <laughs> We're, we're able to find that there there is high concentrations of DNA around the red itself, and and I suppose if it's disturbed, you might get a signal there. But very very specific question. We have another a uh, little bit specific question. Are there any general guidelines for distance between water collections when sampling for amphibians in ponds? Say five feet, ten feet, thirty feet. I'll, I'll tackle that question. It's a great question. Um, people are looking at that question, and there are a couple papers out there. Um, so I, I will try to share that back with the group on the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll look around. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but, but that is a, is a good question of, of spatial inference. And, and that also relates to independence. If you're five feet apart, um, are they independent samples? And then it gets even more complicated when the water's moving, like in rivers. But we, we do see upstream, downstream independence of samples um, at a certain distance. And it, it depends, obviously, on flow and other factors. But um, those, are, those are really important topics. Great. We have one from Seth White. Can the relative proportion of degraded versus intact eDNA in samples be used to tease out older eDNA? For instance, organisms present uh, longer than a week ago versus newer, uh, assuming other environmental factors that degrade DNA are equal. I think there was, um, I never did see it published. There's folks working on some of these ideas though, trying to target multiple um, fragment length for the same organism within a sample and to try to give you an idea of where the DNA is at as far as like the stage of uh, degradation to use to, to answer that exact question like how how long ago was this DNA um, left at the source there so or at the site I mean so uh, yeah I think there's probably some potential there I don't think that's all been worked out though yeah, and my understanding of that topic is that it also is quite dependent on fragment length because you, the longer the fragments, um, you're able to detect them longer in the system. So there's there's it's complicated by the structure of the DNA. Great. I'll ask a couple more questions. Um, I'm interested to learn more about pluses and minuses for tighter protocols and improved equipment to ensure consistency of data. Knowing the discussion of pure science versus applied science having sufficient sideboards on the protocol and equipment standardization may limit variety of data, but increase consistency. Um, Either of you can address maybe the pluses or minuses for tighter protocols and approved equipment, or if you know 
specific protocols? I, I'll take the first stab at that. I, I would say that um, I don't think there are tighter protocols per se. I, I think one hesitation of the field is that it's changing so quickly that um, the idea of best practices and protocols is, is a difficult target because it's moving all the time. Um, and there's been papers written that that mention that they, they do their best to give guiding principles, but they also are wary to to establish protocols. So I think we're a long way from very tight approved protocols and equipment. I think I think the field recognizes that. Matt. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100 percent. I mean, David showed some of these technologies that are being developed for um, sampling and then doing all your your analysis in the field on site, which is a totally different approach than what I described with the lab extraction. Um, so that's really a completely different protocol altogether. And then there's the robotic stuff. Um, so there's a lot of different applications on the horizon that are that are being developed. And uh, I, I do understand the need for having having some standardization, or at least several standard options, so that Folks don't have to know every single thing about um, about all these, you know, all, everything that we just showed. So I, I I understand kind of the frustration there that there are so many methods out there, and I think some standardization, um, even just for a few protocols that can be used, um, is really useful. And you know, David showed a few uh, on the field side of things, a few protocols that are widely used, and. They might not be optimized for every habitat or every organism, but they, they most of these tend to work really pretty well uh, and can be adopted to different habitats with just some simple modification. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, one one thing that we've noticed over our careers is, is um, because the field is moving quickly and there is some uncertainty, um, one response to that from the applied side of things is, well, we don't want to adopt eDNA because it's not ready to be used for real-world application and monitoring. That's not true because there's a, a wide range of options and or not a one-size-fits-all. It doesn't mean that, that the field is not ready to, to be used rigorously um, for specific questions. And like Matt was saying, it, it, it depends on what the question is. But some questions, there are protocols that are working very well and are reproducible. Um, and we're even getting to the point of taking that reproducibility to the lab level and running um, challenges to make sure that if a sample is sent to three different labs, you get the same result. So the field is working hard on these questions. And um, I think we're right at that important interface of, of development um, and at the same time keeping um, working models that, that can be applied to real world questions. Great. All right, we have one more, we have time for one more question and Ryan Hilliard has his hand up. Um, Ryan, if you want to unmute your mic and ask your question, go ahead. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, the question I have is, how do you determine the pore size of your filter or how much water you need to filter in a system that is highly turbid? The, the easiest way to do it is to try try some of the um, filters that are available. Um, in, in turbid systems, the, as far as the water volume, oftentimes the turbidity itself, the, the environment at the site is going to limit your, your water volume to a certain amount. So that, might, that decision there might be made for you unless you want to go down the road of pre-filters and some of these other things to try to maximize volume. But a little bit of pilot work if you if you're setting out to kind of develop a monitoring strategy that you that's going to be more than just a one off a, a little bit of pilot work up front to test this make sure you're getting understand your detection probability you know based on the volume you're expecting to get um, that goes a long way just to ensuring that your you know your survey is going to be adequate for your question Great. Well, I think we got some. Oh, go, David. Did you want to say something? Not me. Okay. Great. Well, I think we got some great questions. And if you have additional questions, feel free to 
send them in the chat and we'll throw them out to David and Matt and see if they can answer them some other time. Um, but I wanted to thank our speakers today. Uh, thought this was a great start to the eDNA webinar series. Um, we did record today's webinar and that video will be posted to PNAMP's YouTube channel or you can just go to pnamp.org and look for the ETIS uh, project page. ETIS is the Emerging Technologies Information Sessions and all the recordings will be linked there as well. Next week, we'll continue the eDNA webinar series with presentation by Carl Osberg. I'll show you that schedule in a second. And the schedule for future webinar series will be in upcoming newsletters. If you don't get the monthly PNAMP newsletter, Amy will put a link into the chat uh, to join uh, for a sign up. It's a sign up form. And those go out, as you'd imagine, monthly. And then additionally, we post all updates to the schedule on the ETIS landing page as they become available. So again, Carl will be presenting next week in the eDNA 201. It's the same time. Um, it'll be a different link to that presentation now. Um, and it'll be covering using environmental DNA for single species assessments. And then the week after that, we have Taylor Wilcox, who will be presenting eDNA 301, which I mentioned earlier is a multi-species and biodiversity assessments focusing on laboratory procedures and interpretation of results, including challenges and future directions. And I believe that is it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. And we hope to see you back next week.